Well, thank, thank you for that very nice introduction. And I'm actually going to go off script right at the start and mention something. So you brought up being, you know, growing up in an ethnic honor culture. My family is French Canadian on my mother's side. And so there's a lot of yelling that takes place just sort of routinely, you know, and it's not people necessarily being angry with each other, but it sounds angry a lot. And we found that when other people come in, if they if they haven't got that background, they can be a little put off. They think we're about to start punching each other and fighting and throwing things. And, you know, I think that's kind of a, a familiar uh, experience, depending on what your upbringing is. So I don't have uh, slides and I don't have a paper to read. Instead, I'm just going to I've got some remarks and, and um, I'm hoping that it'll, it'll provoke some good discussion and some Q&A. And uh, that maybe after I'm done, we'll have a discussion that has lots of different voices and I don't have to say quite as much. So I think it can be very useful for philosophical practitioners to have um, robust understandings and resources of the emotion of anger, the emotions in general, but anger in particular, because these are matters that most people in, in our cultures don't get a lot of helpful guidance or models or teaching about. So for example, you know, when we think about K through 12 education here in the United States, you might get a little bit on the emotions in a health class or a psychology elective, but you're, you're really not going to get much in-depth learning about emotions in, or, or anger. And so people learn about anger because we always are learning. Uh, through their family and, and other group dynamics or through examples or, you know, we brought up social media earlier through seeing terrible uh, interactions and examples on social media or in our broader media, TV shows, movies, uh, you know, literature. And a lot of times these are mistaken or counterproductive or damaging or harmful per perspectives. And just to give you one example that I think most of us will be able to relate to, my wife and I have been watching our way back through some of the older Star Trek stuff and we are watching The Next Generation. And we notice that these people yell at each other a lot. They, you know, one way of like showing that you're taking a situation seriously or that you're in command is yelling at your subordinates. And we, you know, we're watching, we're like, this is kind of weird, isn't it? You know, that these people off in the utopian future are still so upset with each other at the drop of a hat. Um, and so we can ask, well, where do we get our education about anger? Um, if you're fortunate or unfortunate enough to have screwed up, well, you might actually get some counseling about anger, and it might be court mandated, or you're placed in a group or something along those lines. And in, in a lot of cases, that, that's good. That's needed for those people. Um, I went through that myself, but a lot of times it's, it's kind of too late. You've already got these deeply rooted habits and attitudes and ideas. Um, now, there is a large literature out there purporting to give advice and inform us about anger. Some of it is really quite insightful and on point, and some of it is really abysmally bad. And there's everything in between. Um, and here I'm thinking in terms of like self-help literature. So I, I get clients who come to me explicitly motivated to work on anger and um, sometimes it, with other clients, it, it comes up in the course of discussing things with them. You know, there's issues or dynamics or responses that they would do well to examine. And this may be the case for many of you as well. And um, this may be the case for individuals, but also sometimes for groups, for organizations and institutions. You can think about academic departments, which are often quite dysfunctional, right? Or workplaces or meeting groups of, of various sorts. In any of these, anger can become a real problem and it can reinforce and reverberate between people. And so you might say, uh, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, I imagine. Um, somebody could say, well, why not just go to the psychologist instead of philosophy? What does philosophy actually have to contribute? And, you know, a flippant answer to that that I think all of us are familiar with is, well, you know, psychology is sort of an offshoot from 
philosophy originally and but that's that's a terrible answer right because it's clearly progressed you know far away from its original roots as a, a philosophical discipline but we can say that you know psychology doesn't have a monopoly on insights about the emotions in general or anger in particular and when we think about psychology you know, this is a vast field with many different, often competing, even contradictory approaches and assumptions and methods. And when you go and survey the field just in the present, you're not going to find any actual consensus, although some people will try to sell you on this, about what the emotions are, how they function, which ones are the most basic. They don't even agree about that completely. Which ones are good or bad, what situations uh, they're good or bad in, or what modalities of therapy would be the best. It's not the proverbial Wild West where like anything goes, but there isn't a consensus. And I think that that should lead us to a recognition that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of approaches that could be brought to bear on this, and we could take a kind of pluralist attitude and approach to this. Um, you know, philosophy has a lot to contribute to understanding and dealing or working with anger, and, um, you know, other fields do as well. And we can even see that the good psychologists, the ones who are philosophically informed about these matters, they recognize that. So the cognitive approaches will often talk about stoicism. We see references to Aristotle in other approaches. Um, sometimes they'll even take up, you know, Plato and, and uh, some of the things that he has to say. The emotional intelligence movement begins with a quote in Goldman's first book, that comes directly from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, right? Ang and about how anger, it's tough to, to figure out exactly how to, to do it right. And so I, I think that um, not taking license to buy into any old thing that we like, we should grant ourselves and our clients freedom to, you know, study, explore, discuss, and apply multiple approaches to anger in a reason reasonable way, right? We, we do have to be able to provide justifications for what we're doing. And so today, I'm actually going to talk in a more restricted way about philosophy. I'm just going to talk about ancient philosophy and just ancient Western philosophy. Um, although there's lots and lots of insights throughout the history of philosophy, all sorts of things in non-Western philosophy, um, I want to keep it a little bit restricted, and I also want to stick to stuff that I actually understand fairly well. <laughs> so I, I don't purport to be an expert in non-Western philosophy. So, you know, um, we've got these ancient cultures, and they certainly thought that anger was a, a big problem. It's taken seriously by ancient philosophers, also by medical professionals, and there's a good bit of overlap between the two in poetry. You know, for example, think about the Iliad and the many discussions of anger going on in their religious literature. And it's, it's viewed in a lot of different ways in this literature. Um, one of the issues is it's, it's um, an ever-present possibility for conflict, conflict that can turn deadly, conflict that can destroy communities, poison people's lives, and it can lead to a cycle of revenge and retribution. Um, so you might say, oh, well, it clearly anger is bad. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's also tied in very closely with conceptions of what is socially appropriate, what is just and unjust. It's, it's one of what we often call the moral emotions, right? So it's, there's a very, you know, you could say complicated attitude towards anger, and it's given some serious thought in literature and, in particular, in philosophy, where from Plato onward, we see a variety of distinct approaches to it developed over the course of centuries, lots of incorporation of empirical or experiential observation and reflection on the part of these philosophers. And uh, a lot of useful practices and criteria that are developed, uh, including for ethical approaches to anger. You know, thinking about when is anger a good thing, when is it a bad thing, how is it a good thing or a bad thing. 
And there's a considerable overlap between the medical practices and authors and the philosophical ones. And, and this reflects a sort of continuum in ancient uh, Mediterranean and Near Eastern culture. Uh, between mental illness and disorder, you know, or, or disease is the word that's often used, nosos in, in Greek, and the emotions, and then moral development and evaluation. So, you know, we see, for example, the Stoic uh, Galen, um, or not the, not the Stoic Galen, sorry, the, the uh, medical author Galen engaging with the Stoic author Chrysippus, and this is actually how we have a lot of Chrysippus's um, passages that are preserved in this guy. And you say, yeah, they get gets this right, gets this wrong. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of characteristic of, of that. And it gets a little bit more complicated. We've not only got these uh, philosophical schools out there developing over the course of centuries, we also have religious perspectives taking these up as Judaism and Christianity become widespread in later ancient Mediterranean culture. Those religious teachings and frameworks and models and practices will engage in very rich ways with philosophy. So one prime example of this would be the early Christian writer Lactantius and his essay on the anger of God where he talks about the Stoics and the Epicureans and how they're getting things right and how his fellow Christians are also or, or get things wrong and what bits they get right and also with his fellow Christians where they get things wrong about whether God can be angry or whether it would be appropriate and whether it's appropriate for us to get angry as, as well. Now there are some challenges involved in drawing upon this ancient, you know, set of philosophical schools. Um, you know, it's a different culture that we're, we're dealing with from our own. They have different views on the body and mind. Um, terminology can sometimes trip people up. A great example of this is that term thumos, which is translated frequently in misleading ways as spirit or passion or better as the spirited part or the passionate part or interestingly in the philokalia as the incandescent part, which is a, a nice way of, of talking about it. Sometimes it doesn't mean this part of the soul. In Aristotle, it just means anger or irritation. Um, sometimes it's used to mean a more intense kind of anger, like, you know, we translate as rage or fury. So you, you got to be a little bit careful with the, the terminology, right? It helps to know Greek or Latin if you're going to these authors. The other thing that um, makes it kind of tricky, there's relatively few surviving treatises directly about anger itself. We know that some existed that we've lost because they're referenced in the available literature. So we kind of have to put in a lot of work <clears throat> or rely upon that of others to piece together a composite account of anger. Great example of this is Aristotle. He talks about anger, I think if I remember right when I went through and numbered it in about 13 different texts in different ways. And he explicitly says, well, there's this way of looking at it, and there's this way of looking at it, and if we're doing uh, you know, uh, sort of medical studies, we look at it this way as, as blood boiling around the heart. If we're looking at it dialectically, we look at it this way. So you gotta do a lot of what, what I call philosophical detective work in, in some cases. Um, another challenge that I think is also um, an issue sometimes, some of the philosophers and schools view anger as always bad as destructive and vicious. The Stoics and Cicero are prime examples. Others have more complex views about anger and its moral status or its usefulness. So you got to kind of determine where you're going to fall. You can't, you can't accept everybody's teachings. Sooner or later, you got to take a stand. And uh, another issue, a practical problem, some of our clients might be distrustful of bringing in ancient philosophy or philosophies. I don't know if any of you have ever run into this. I encounter it particularly in business contexts where if I tell them that I'm drawing upon the Stoics or Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas, their eyes glaze over. So I don't, I don't tell them. I just like give them the ideas. And then later on, when they come and ask me, oh, where'd you get these great ideas from? I said, well, you know, they're, they're coming from here, right? <laughs> Maybe you'd like to read this stuff. So, you know, that can be an issue. Um, you know, we want to let them experience, have some application, and then see some results. So what schools and authors and texts would be useful? 
Um, I'm not going to give you an exclusive list. I'm just going to put some on your radar. So this is a little bit of a, a teaser, but I, I will talk about four main philosophical traditions. So there's the Platonic tradition, which is Plato, right, and his dialogues, but also the Middle Platonists like Plutarch and Alcinous, um, both of whom are very useful to read, and then Neoplatonists like Plotinus and Simplicius. Um, very influential on other authors later on. We have an Aristotelian tradition, which of course includes Aristotle and his good friend and successor Theophrastus, but also later commentators like Alexander of Aphrodisias. We have an Epicurean tradition, which unfortunately we've lost most of the literature from, but we're in the process of recovering some of it, at least with the scrolls at Herculaneum and you know, Philodemus's writings. And then we have a Stoic tradition, which again, we've also lost a lot of literature from, but we do have late or Roman Stoics, Roman Imperial Stoics like Seneca and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and some others, but those are the three that really have to say useful stuff about anger. And you know, then we get some eclectic philosophers like Cicero, who I particularly admire, although I disagree with him about, about anger. And then we have all these interesting Jewish and Christian thinkers that we might turn to. I mentioned Lactantius, we have Philo of Alexandria, John Cassian, Augustine, and this is all just in the early, arguably still ancient period. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've lost a lot of the literature that dealt with anger, and there might be some really fascinating stuff in there by, you know, Jerome or Posidonius, but we got to stick with what we've got. And what we've got is pretty rich. So what resources do we actually have by these schools? Here's where we start getting down to the nuts and bolts. So you may not realize it because Plato never writes a text called On Anger or, you know, thematizes it in any of the dialogues. But if you pay close attention to dialogues like the Euthyphro, the Gorgias, the Apology, you will see him discussing dynamics that bear upon anger. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those in, in just a bit. Uh, the Republic, obviously, you know, that thumos, the middle part of the soul, really centrally important. It, it's not just the part with which we get angry. It's also about, you know, social status and, and a few other things. But, you know, anger is viewed as something needed in there. And we can supplement that tripartite psychology by looking at two other dialogues, the Phaedrus and the Timaeus. So there's already a lot there in Plato. And then if we look at Elkinous's Handbook of Platonism, we'll see anger and the other passions discussed there. Uh, if we look at Plutarch's great text on controlling anger, clearly, you know, something uh, uh, that's a resource. He's also touching on it in other works like On Moral Virtue. When we turn to the Aristotelian tradition, um, anger gets discussed, as I mentioned, in a lot of Aristotle's works. The, the primary places to go to are Rhetoric Book Two, where it's the very first of the emotions that gets discussed. Um, a number of parts of the Nicomachean and Eudamian ethics. So, you know, there's that famous passage that I mentioned. It's easy to get angry, but not easy to get angry with the right person, right time, right way. That's in book two. Book four discusses virtues and vices concerning anger. Uh, book seven discusses loss or lack of self-control with respect to anger. And then there's other things, you know, the politics, the topics. And so I won't go on too much with that. There is a lost Aristotelian tree by this guy Hieronymus or Jerome. Uh, we don't we don't actually know what's in it. Um, maybe we'll find it someday, but uh, we can't read what we don't have. And then there's some interesting stuff in Alexander of Aphrodisias's works and commentaries. And Alexander is, is kind of a cool guy because he's not only a faithful Aristotelian, but he also sees the need to engage all the other philosophical schools. So the Stoics, the Epicureans, people that Aristotle couldn't have known about. Right? And then we've got the Epicureans, Epicurus's works, what we have of them. Uh, there's some discussions of anger and Lucretius's on the nature of things. But we also have this later philosopher, Philodemus, and he wrote a book on anger. Now, unfortunately, when they unrolled those scrolls at the first you know, time, they damaged part of that. So we only have portions of the text. But 
Portions are better than nothing, and it's quite interesting what we have. He also mentions anger in other works like On Frank Criticism, you know, about pararesia, how, how to tell students that they're screwing up, or maybe clients that they're screwing up, right? And then we have the Stoics, and the Stoics have a lot of stuff about anger. Seneca has an entire book called On Anger. And there's a lot of other useful discussions in his works. And then if you go through Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, you see them talking about it as well. It was clearly viewed as a, a real problem by them. And there are some common insights across these different schools. So some of the things they share in common that I think we can find quite helpful in dealing with, with clients, as well as our own anger, um, emotions are cognitive. Right? They're not just responses. They have thoughts driving them, judgments, assumptions, and even reasoning components. Aristotle says that, that anger syllogizes in Nicomachean Ethics, book seven. He uses that word, uh, right? It doesn't mean it makes syllogisms, of course. It just it reasons out things. Um, and emotions can also, and this is something that I think our society for a while went uh, in the wrong directions with, uh, emotions can and should be evaluated ethically. You can say, this is a good emotion, this is a bad emotion, or this is good in this respect, and this is bad now that we've put it into this context over here. And, you know, the judgments need to be kind of sophisticated and flexible, but we are making ethical ju uh, judgments. Uh, another key aspect I think that all of these philosophers recognize is the importance of habits for our emotional life. Um, you know, we have to identify the habits that we have. <clears throat> we need to build good habits. We need to break bad habits and replace them with, with better habits. Uh, we also need to attend to our own responsibility our moral responsibility, our capacity for choosing, for deciding uh, which direction we're going to go with, uh, with our, not only our actions, but our feelings. So, you know, there are some people who get angry because they like getting angry. That could be a matter of habit, but that's also a matter of what you choose in that situation. So realizing that we actually do have some measure of control, even when we feel like we're out of control. That's very, very liberating for a lot of people. Uh, another thing I think is very important that doesn't get talked about so much by these ancient authors, but we, we can certainly see it developing um, along their lines is the importance of narratives or the stories that we tell about ourselves, about the situations that we're in. You know, I'm angry at that person because they said this mean thing to me. Uh, there's a story there, right? That's, that's a narrative. It's not simply a, a situation. And we live within narratives. And some, some have already talked about trauma and, you know, the self-accounting that people give. That can be uh, very important and compatible with these, these ancient authors. And then finally, um, you know, they all have a, a focus on development of the human person, not just as an isolated thing, an isolated substance, but as a person within a matrix of relationships. And I think that is also uh, incredibly important, particularly in a time when there is a tendency to use models that may be um, less helpful, like thinking of us as like just nodes in a computer network or, you know, machines or, or things like that. There are some key differences. Uh, the biggest dividing point is whether anger is something good or bad. Um, Cicero and the Stoics say it's always, always bad. Um, I think that you can still draw upon them without necessarily buying into that assumption. The Platonists, the Epicureans, Aristotelians, they see some legitimate role for anger. And I, and I should mention that when it comes to the religious thinkers coming later on, this split goes down them as well. So you will find John Cassian saying, the only time you should ever get angry is at your own vices, right? And you'll find other people like Augustine or John Chrysostom saying, oh no, you can get angry at the right time. You just got to watch it. Don't, you know, don't give too much scope to it because then it can turn into something like hatred. But no, you, you need anger some, some of the time. So th there's a lot of differences about that. Um, 
with people like the Stoics, um, there are a wealth of useful practices that they provide, also Plutarch as well. And that's very helpful. In other cases, we have to read what they've got and derive the practices ourselves. So there are <clears throat> what we might call Aristotelian practices that deal with anger, but they're not coming directly from Aristotle. We have to develop those. And so um, a few things about those different perspectives. So, you know, as I mentioned, Plato, we've got this whole issue of thumos, what is its proper use, what is its direction, how do we develop it, right? It's a part of the soul. Um, Plato himself in his works will tell us some of the causes for anger. He says that we get angry when we're treated wrongly, um, when people are viewed as responsible for their own badness, like in the Protagoras, uh, when they pretend to have knowledge or skill that they lack, Gorgias mentions that. And very interestingly, in the Euthyphro, which most people are reading because of the you know stuff about the Euthyphro dilemma, he's actually got a discussion in there why human beings and gods get angry at each other when they have differences. And they are differences over moral values, over the good and the bad, the just and the unjust, the noble and the base, or however we want to translate Kalod and Eisthron and other moral values. So not just what these are, but what the bearers of them are, who's actually noble, who's not. These are things that people get, get worked up over. And it's in part because they're hard to resolve. Aristotle, we just get an entire theory of anger, very rich that we have to piece together from different works. He's got analyses of the causes and workings of anger, discussions of the difference between anger and other emotions like hatred, how anger works with loss of self-control and, and you know um, not sticking to our commitments. He's got moral evaluations of anger, or at least criteria for that that can be extraordinarily helpful. Um, Epicurus himself has less to say directly about anger, at least in the few texts that we have by him. But there's a lot of implications for how we understand and deal with anger. Um, but Philodemus, as I mentioned, has a whole book on anger. And he frames the Epicurean position as in between the Stoic, you know, zero tolerance and the Aristotelian, which in his view is a little bit too lax. Uh, he makes a really helpful distinction between natural and uh, natural anger, which we should indulge or use, and then empty or vain anger, which is what most people feel, and he discusses how this arises. And then the Stoics, again, we don't necessarily want to buy into the, it's always bad, you know, uh, get rid of anger completely, unless you want to, right? I mean, if you're attracted to that point of view. Um, but the goal for them is to live a happy, free, tranquil life that allows you to experience positive emotions. Um, they've got an interesting discussion about how it is that we get angry. Where is it that we're getting angry? And they have a very heavy emphasis, as do a lot of these others, on self-knowledge and on what they call ascasis or discipline training, you know, weaning ourselves away from, from bad um, responses, bad, bad knee-jerk uh, uh, engagements with the world. So what are some of the useful practices that they, they offer? <clears throat> I want to give you two for each of these groups. Obviously, they have way, way more than that. So from Plato, uh, now, this is not in Plato. This is derived from Plato. If we know that we get angry at people when they seem to not share our perception of moral qualities, what's just and what's unjust, or what's beautiful and what's ugly, or noble or, or base, we can get angry at them very easily. These are things that we get really, really worked up about and get into terrible arguments where we're, you know, we're, we're talking past each other. If we know that, then we can head that off. Or if our clients need to know that, you know, when you, you go into certain groups uh, and they're arguing past each other about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, I wanna, this is a side note, but one of the really great skills that I think is not unique to philosophy, but perhaps gets developed more on the whole in philosophy than in other disciplines is making distinctions at the right time. 
we have a lot of practice with this. And you go into meetings with non-philosophers and they get into these arguments and you're like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Let's talk this through. You're right in this respect. You're right in this respect. And you're talking about different things. They look at you like you're doing magic because they could be doing it. It's not hard to do, but we think to do that. That's sort of our natural res trained response, you could say. So for, again, from Plato, when we see people doing that, we can intervene. Um, from Plutarch, a middle Platonist who's got an entire book on how to control anger, he's got this uh, great observation about the tendency that human beings have to conflate their, their emotion of anger with something that seems a bit better. And the, it's often translated as righteous indignation, but the Greek for it is better translated as hatred of wickedness, misos kakia, right? So, you know, there is genuine wickedness or evil in the world, and we probably should have a negative reaction to it. And maybe it's okay even to, to hate really serious wickedness. But most of the time, our anger is not us wearing the, you know, white hat of the Western and being the good person who's completely pure, <laughs> whose motives are unimpunable, right? And uh, fighting against the, the, the evil people. So if we can, you know, we can say, ah, okay, it's understandable you get angry, but let's not confuse it with this other uh, emotional reaction over here that seems a little bit better. And Plutarch thinks that this is a big problem in his time. I suspect it's a big problem in our time, too. Uh, from Aristotle, one of the first things I think is, is quite useful to bring up, he's got that passage that many of you have probably run across, anger is like a hasty servant. And this is where he says anger syllogizes, right? How is it like a hasty servant? It listens to half of what's said, draws some inferences, rushes off to go do things. And so it, it you know, observes something and it's like, oh, that person just slighted me. Uh, this must not stand. I'd better go and, and do something, I retaliate against them. So if we know that we have a tendency to carry out rational thought processes that are on one level rational and also irrational, once again, we can be, you know, on the guard against that. We can catch it while it's going on. Or if we see somebody else starting to go down that course, we can perhaps intervene and, and help them out. Um, another thing that, that I think is really helpful from Aristotle, you know, this was talked about a little bit earlier in uh, the last presentation, the doctrine of the mean. Um, Aristotle doesn't just think that you want something that's in the middle numerically, right? He, he says there's a lot of other things that we can translate as right, meaning how things ought to be. So do you get angry with the right person as opposed to, you know, turning your anger against somebody who's more convenient or uh, in a lower position than you so you can kick downward? Are, are you getting angry over the right things at the right time for the right amount of time, uh, displaying your anger in the right ways? These are all criteria that we can turn into practices and ask about. Now, there isn't a hard and fast rule for these, right? Um, who exactly should I get angry at when my computer doesn't work the way I want it to? Should I get angry at the computer itself? Kind of irrational. Uh, should I get angry at the company, in my case, Apple? Should I get angry at the... Um, customer service person, the, the right answer to all this probably shouldn't get angry at anybody, anybody in this case, right? Uh, unless, say, they targeted me with a virus or, you know, bricked my phone or something like that. So those are some useful practices. Um, from Epicurus, there's that great passage that I think many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, a person cannot live pleasantly unless they live um, justly, prudently, and well. And well is kalos, translating, you know, nobly. We can think about what that actually means. What is it to live justly? You, can you get angry at anybody you want to and live justly? No, not really. Is it prudent to get angry over minor things? 
no. And and what do you look like when you get angry? I, I, you know, this is not one I was actually going to bring up, but it gets discussed in both the Platonic and the Epicurean. And if I remember right, the Stoic traditions, imagine bringing up a mirror in front of your face when you're angry. And we can do this. Well, I, don't, I guess I don't have, no, here it is. <laughs> we can do this with our technology, right? Just take a selfie of your angry face or, you know, even better, like a little movie, and you can see what it, uh, a mess you look like, right? Uh, and you can think about that every time that you get angry. Um, Philodemus wants to uh, suggest that we should think about what we're getting angry over. Are we getting angry over legitimate matters, like somebody, say, bullying my child and the authorities doing nothing about it? Or are we getting angry over what the Epicureans called empty or vain opinions, kenodoxia, and desires? You know, the things that, and we've talked about this a little bit in the, this conference, the culture that we live in is constantly throwing images at us about what we ought to look like, what we ought to desire. The Epicureans would say most of that is, uh, frankly, BS, and we don't want to buy into it. So if we can strip those things away, we can be less angry. Um, Seneca, who, as I mentioned, has an entire book on anger with lots and lots of practices. Um, one of the ones that I particularly like is reminding ourselves when we're getting angry at somebody over something that we ourselves do the same thing. Or if we don't do the same thing, we would do the same thing if we were in the same sort of situation or we desire to do the same thing and we just don't do it. Uh, we're, we're not as great as we pretend. You know, we, we get angry because we place ourselves on a higher level than, than other people and uh, look at them as, you know, the scumbags that are doing these awful things when uh, we're likely to do it too. And if we do that, we can be a lot more forgiving towards people. Uh, Marcus Aurelius has to remind himself of this at various points in the meditations. Um, Epictetus, um, and now th what he's saying, Seneca and Marcus and many other Stoics say as well, but he really stresses, so this must have been an issue for him, that when we're getting angry at people for either their individual actions or being the kind of person that they are, like he talks about robbers, and he did get robbed, you know, they took his lamp at one point, right? Um, he says, well, we can realize that people are doing the wrong things even deliberately and knowingly, because on some level they're in error, they're mixed up. They don't know what's actually good for human beings. And you know, this, this helps overcome the objection of saying, well, what about the person who's mean to me and they know they're being mean to me? Well, on some level they're screwed up. They've, they've got the conception that the best thing in life is to be a, a mean person to other people. And if you see them that way, it doesn't mean that what they do isn't bad or wrong. But you can be like, oh, you poor bastard. You obviously don't say this to them. Uh, but you can have that in your head and be like, oh, you, you screwed up, you know, hot mess of a human being. Uh, no wonder you're doing stupid things like this to me you know, that I don't like. But then you won't get as angry at them. You can feel compassion, as Epictetus says, eleos, uh, which is usually translated as pity. But I think compassion is a better translation. So how would we use these with, with clients? Here we go. We can talk about these different practices, and there's many, many more. But there's other things that are distinctive to philosophical counseling um, that, you know, all of you heard about from uh, the, the training sessions very, you know, early on. Bibliotherapy is one of them, right? You have your clients actually, if they're willing to do it, uh, read some passages or perhaps even read entire books. Plutarch's uh, On Controlling Anger is quite short and um, most of it is germane. A little bit of it is ancient culture that doesn't have much to do with our lives, but most of it is, is pretty on point. Um, you can also spend a lot of time, and this is something you do dialogically, right? Examining and evaluating assumptions that contribute to responses of anger or are built into thought processes. You can unpack those. This is that cognitive aspect. And what we can do, again, to go back to that making distinctions, we don't have to tell our clients, oh, your thought processes are just completely degenerate and damaged, get rid of them altogether. We can say, okay, so, you know, this 
idea that you've got over here, it's not completely wrong, but you're misapplying it. You know, you've, you've had some bad experiences and those are bad experiences and there are bad people who will keep doing that to you, say in the workplace, but not everybody's doing that. So maybe you need to qualify, maybe you need to make distinctions, right? Um, narrating and discussing the client's dynamics that are pertaining to anger, or if you're doing consulting with a group, maybe observing their, their processes with each other and saying, aha, somebody's uh, starting to get hot over here. Let's figure out what's going on. Is, is it a, you know, argument over moral qualities? Does somebody feel slighted right, rightly or wrongly? Are there some crazy ideas, some kenodoxia, you know, uh, empty opinions that are floating around over here uh, that are causing lots and lots of tension for, for, for people? Um, Learning how to distinguish between legitimate feelings and responses of anger and more problematic ones, I think this is really, really helpful. And we, you know, we can't just say things like, well, anytime you get angry, it's a bad thing, like the Stoics think. I think we, we want to be able to have some criteria to provide about when being angry makes sense. But then we also have to say, okay, it makes sense to go this far, but not further with it. Um, and then understanding how to deal with other people's anger. This is also incredibly important because anger tends to provoke other emotions in response, including anger, you know, who are you to get upset with me, but also uh, fear. Um, if people have a background where they've been abused, exploited, um, prevented from expressing their own anger, seeing other people getting angry might, um, you know, bring all sorts of, of uh, negative feelings back up that then they have to deal with. So, you know, understanding why people are angry and whether they're, you know, legitimately angry or angry over over things that they shouldn't be and then determining what you want to do in response that could be something that we deal with in philosophical counseling and then um, I think the last part about that is it's very important to stress to our clients that there aren't any silver bullets when it comes to anger right when people get angry and they're having problems with anger just like any other issue it's not going to be that they've just got one mistaken assumption in their head, like a switch that can be flipped. There's going to be a whole complex of things that you kind of have to work at bit by bit. And this is why the ancient philosophers talked in terms of escasis or discipline, um, the need to rework oneself. So I'm going to close by bringing up, I mean, it wouldn't be a, a good APPA um, presentation if we didn't do at least one short case study, right? So I'm going to bring up one that's a little bit unusual. Most of my clients that come to me uh, to work on anger, it's because they're, they're really screwing up, right? They've managed to alienate some people or lose a job or a relationship has been damaged. I had a person who came to me when I was doing executive coaching. He was a chief information officer in a really big company. And he, he said that he had anger problems, and his anger problems were of a different order. He would go into these meetings with these other C-suite executives, and they're all kind of type A personalities, razzing each other, trying to like jockey for a position and stuff. And he was perhaps a little less so. He seemed to be a fairly you know, reasonable person. And they would, uh, a few people in there, not everybody, they would, they would get him rattled. And he would find that he didn't perform, this is his words, as adequate, adequately as he wanted to. He wasn't presenting the information as well as he could. And he had a limited time frame in which to talk, too. So he didn't want to be um, you know, spending too much of it like responding to these, these people being jerks to him. And I said, well, you're actually doing really well, but we can work on this. So I suggested to him, 
Um, a very common practice that many of you probably know about coming from the Stoics that we sometimes call negative visualization or premeditation of adversity where you spend a bit of time before you get into something that you find um, disturbing or bothersome or, or scary and you think about it. You know, what, what would this be like? So I, I told them, okay, so spend three minutes before you go into the meeting in your office just thinking about these few people and the things they're likely to say to you and you know just think about whether you can deal with this and it will help kind of inoculate you against it and he found that useful you know there was a success story with this um, albeit at kind of a, he was it, you know this is kind of the uh, proverbial shooting fish in a barrel right it's not dealing with a much more difficult uh, things where people are actually like shouting at each other and red in the face but it worked for this guy so that's that's just one example of how this could be helpful and and I see that I, I'm getting uh, short on time I'm already bleeding over into the Q&A so I'll just wrap up there and uh, let's we can discuss you can ask questions if you want uh, I'm happy to l turn it over to side conversation if you'd like to do that sort of thing either